Yeah, good day again. It's uh, Charlie ZL2 CTM. Well, I just want to do a video today looking at the uh, IF amplifiers uh, and then the IF strip from a coupling transformer point of view. So I mentioned uh, on a previous video that uh, from the IF amplifier point of view, I'm going to use the same core configuration that I've used for the other amplifiers uh, on the radio. So again, uh, for simplicity, I'm just going to stick with the, the 3904 as the transistor. Um, the IF amplifier, uh, or the IF strip more the point, will be running at 9 megahertz. And for the core configuration, I've uh, set it up to be, like I say, the same, with 10 milliamps flowing through for a quiescent current, uh, and then setting, uh, setting more the point, the emitter voltage at 1 volt. I haven't gone through the maths in this particular page here uh, because it's on a previous uh, video and also up online and on the blog. But again, works out to be funny old thing. Uh, 20 kilo, say again, 20 k ohms for R1, 3 k ohms for R2, and then an emitter resistor of 100 ohms. Um, I fully bypass that with a 0.1 microfarad capacitor uh, running that, uh, and I've also decoupled uh, the uh, VCC line. Uh, to earth through the 0.1 microfarad, uh, not shown uh, shown here, uh, will be the sort of typical 100 microfarads, yeah, 100 microfarad um, capacitor there just to help smooth and filter that input voltage coming in uh, and running at 13.8 volts. So, uh, so once I've built this up, um, what I do need to do before working out what the coupling transformers are, uh, which I'll show in a sec, uh, is what the um, I'll call it impedance, but I'm only looking at the resistive side. So when I say impedance, just just again, I'm only looking at the resistive side. Uh, the input impedance and also the output impedance. Uh, for the output impedance, I have, and I'm going to use uh, for testing purposes, a 10-turn um, RFC, radio frequency choke, using an FT37-43 to try and get a nice, really high uh, inductive reactance um, at this point here, or from an RFC point of view, because um, that's going to be that's going to be folded over to Earth through that uh, capacitor here, and then I'm going to look into here and try and work out what the the output uh, impedance is. On the input side, uh, I've used a nano VNA, so uh, a slightly different approach than I have done in the past. Uh, in the past, I have used um, R1 in parallel with R2 in parallel with whatever is here looking into the base of this trans, uh, transistor which is, this is high at this side so it can be ignored um, but coming through here would be little re um, well in fact sorry I'll, I'll take that back it's beta AC divided by our frequency of operation times um, little re plus big re um, little re is 26 divided by our emitter current uh, in, in milliamps, so 26 divided by 10 equals 2.6 plus our emitter resistor. In this particular case, our emitter resistor is fully bypassed, so that would equal zero. Um, that's what I've traditionally done in the past, and if you look at some of the previous videos and up on the blog, you'll see those calculations. But for this particular case, I thought I would be different uh, and use the nano VNA. So I did that, so um, just to talk about it now, I guess. Um, I set this up to output um, a CW frequency of 9 megs, so the frequency of operation, um, and then just used a Smith chart to read off what um, it was seeing. And it turned out to be 35 ohms. Right, on the output side, like I say, I'm going to treat the amplifier as, a, um, as just a source, which has some kind of internal resistance. Um, and what I'm going to do for a start is I'm going to this is clearly not an amplifier, but this is the way I'm going to treat it. I'm going to use the SIGGEN over here to feed into the amplifier a known signal, and I'm going to adjust the amplitude of that until I get on the output of um, the, oops, Azzy, on the, uh, the O-scope there, a, a known fixed value. In this particular case, I'll be setting it up to be um, just on 12 volts. And you see a slight adjustment there. On 12 volts, and I'm then going to, like I say, set the input so at this point here equals 12 volts 
open load, i.e. with no load on it. So if that voltage there is, for example, in this particular case, 12 volts, there's no current flowing because there's no load, um, therefore there's no voltage drop across this resistor, the internal resistance that is, so my 12 volts is the same as 12 volts right here. As soon as I put a load on, current will flow, and then there will be some kind of voltage drop being dropped across the internal resistance, and then also um, a voltage now forming on my load. And I'm going to vary my load. That's this, well, just to pan down a bit. That's what this uh, little trim pot here is. I'm going to vary that until I have a voltage at this point here of half of, of what my original voltage was in this particular case. I'm going to vary it until I get down to 6 volts. And once I get to 6 volts, then um, because it's a voltage divider, there's 12 there, 6 there, therefore this resistance must be the same as this resistance. I can then take this value here, or this uh, trim uh, resistor, uh, trim pot, out of circuit with a no meter, measure its resistance, and then whatever that is, I can then say that that's what the uh, internal is. And that's exactly how I've got it set up here. We'll see the radio frequency choke here, the output is being coupled through a 100 nanofarad capacitor uh, through just a switch so I can just switch in and out easily um, that uh, trim pot. Right here, so that's the configuration and like I say I'm pretty well on roughly uh, 12 volts there it's just shifted a bit since I started filming but close enough and as you can see here as I vary that trim pot if I put it into circuit which is now in the circuit, so it's now hanging on the on the uh, the back of that amplifier. As I vary its value, we can see there that that's voltage drop across it varies. And all I have to do there is just drop that down to it reads six volts, which is about there. I can then that's just dropped off a bit because of my finger for the RF, but just let's pretend that was actually now down to six volts. I can then take it out of circuit, uh, measure its value, and off we go. So that's the theory anyway, and that's exactly what I did, a little bit more accurately than I have just demonstrated there, but that's um, I guess I just sort of demonstrated the, the, the process. So that then leads on to the coupling uh, transformers. So for my IF strip here on receive, we've got the, uh, the input mixer, which is mixing our RF down to our intermediate frequency. Uh, that's now flowing all the way through either our CW or our SSB filter. Uh, coming through to our product detector uh, and with then having our audio or our baseband uh, on the output of that. We know that the uh, those two SBL1s are 50 ohm devices, so input and output is 50 ohms. Uh, through the process I've just talked about with the IF amplifier, I know that my uh, input is 35 ohms and my output is uh, 480 ohms. I'm now going to, and I didn't mention it, I'll now remove that radio frequency choke and in here I'll just have a stock standard transformer uh, which will then match uh, that 480 ohms through to whatever the load is. So that's what I've depicted here, 35 and 480 for both the IF1 and IF2 amplifiers which are exactly the same from the configuration point of view. And then as we mentioned in the previous video our CW filter wants to see 50 ohms to get the uh, an acceptable passband ripple, uh, and the SSB filter wants to see 170 ohms, so which is depicted here. So I need a transformer to transform these. I need two here, one going in this direction, and then one going in that direction. Same thing coming out of here, and then matching in the output of IF2 through to the mixer. Um, the good thing is some of those transformers, because the values are the same. Uh, I can use I can just do the calculation once, and then because things are just backwards, I just have, just got to turn the transformer uh, around, which is good. So um, I won't go into the formats here, but we know that our our turns ratio is the square root of um, Z1 over Z2, or in this particular case, just the resistances 480 over 170 as an example, uh, and that becomes up with our N. Now. The other rule of thumb that I, uh, I'm using is for the smaller, as an example here, for this 50 to 35 ohms, it turns out to be um, 6 turns to 5 turns. Now, why, why did I choose um, 6 turns and 5 turns to, to do that? 
I take the smaller of the turns, so obviously 5 is less than 6, and here 6 is less than 10, so this is the smaller um, uh, winding. And I want to make sure that the inductive reactance of that smaller winding is approximately equal to, or certainly greater than, would be the better way of putting it, uh, 4 to 5 times whatever the load is hanging off, or, or that's attached to that smaller winding. So, but we need to find out then XL, well, XL equals 2 pi uh, FL, where F is our frequency of operation. Uh, in this particular case, it's fixed at 9 megs because it's an intermediate frequency, which um, is fixed. Uh, if this was an RF amplifier, say up here somewhere, which was then having to amplify a range of frequencies, then I would set F to be the frequency uh, or the lowest frequency of operation. Uh, why the lowest? Because that's the worst case scenario. As F goes down, XL goes down, which makes this harder to comply with. As frequency goes up, that goes up, life gets a lot easier. So it's the lowest frequency of operation. But again, it, as I just mentioned, it's an IF amplifier, so it's fixed at 9 megs. Anyway, uh, so the only other unknown is inductance. Um, I'm using FT37 43s as the cause. So I just jump online and um, torgroid.info is a, a site that I use all the time. Uh, just plug in whatever my turns is, in this particular case five turns, plug into that uh, calculator and it spits out the, uh, the inductance which I can then feed back into here. And I made life easy for myself and just uh, made up a quick spreadsheet which had a, a range of uh, potential turns using this turns ratio here. Um, I like to start at around uh, 5 turns, so in 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Um, I then uh, did this calculation here and then compared whatever the inductive reactance was for what it was, the, uh, the load was hanging off it um, and then chose the smallest um, value of turns to meet that requirement. Why the smallest number of turns? Eh. Because I just don't, you know, there's just no point. If, if I can have a turns ratio of, say, 6 to 5, and that meets my requirements, then, you know, why do I want to have, say, 30 turns or 40 turns or 100 turns? It just seems, seems pointless. Not to mention losses and the like. So uh, I, I went for the smallest number of turns that met my requirements. Um, and that's the approach I took. I hope that made a little bit of sense. But like I say, these are not tutorials. Um, I am certainly not an expert in any way, shape, or form in any of this. I'm just trying to pass on the approach I've taken, uh, which seems to work for me. Um, and like I say, certainly not a textbook approach, but um, like I say, it works. Okay, so next steps now. Uh, for me, if I look at my little box of tricks, I've got most of the components now, from a sub-module point of view, ready to go to actually turn this into a radio. So next steps will be take the big board, uh, lay out a, uh, a nice earth plane and then start just to quietly, once I've wound the, the coupling transformers and I can get rid of this um, RFC here, I can then lay out the, the sub-modules um, where I want them, tack them down and start to wire things up. So uh, this is where things get quite interesting and we'll start to have a receiver very shortly um, and then very quickly after that will be a, a low power transmitter because again all of those components are ready to go. Anyway, so I'll say 73 here and I will start to now think about layout. Looking forward to it. See you soon.